In this lesson, we're going to look at car safety. The first aim is describe how different factors affect stopping distance. Secondly, explain how to calculate momentum. And finally, explain how car safety devices work, mathematically speaking. You may have heard older people say they don't make them like they used to. Sometimes that's a bad thing, as basically companies use cheaper and cheaper materials to basically make more profit. But sometimes this can definitely be a good thing. Before the 1950s, cars were far more robust. They could take a battering. In fact, if you drove a car into the wall, the chances are the car would still be intact. Nowadays, cars have consciously been designed to crumple on impact. Now, you may think that's a bad thing, but actually that's a life-saving feature. And to understand this, we have to understand the concept of momentum. But before we get there, we're going to look at stopping distance. For those of you who are interested in driving, this is not only useful for your physics exam, but also for your driving theory test. Your stopping distance can be calculated by adding the thinking distance and the braking distance. So let's say, for example, you were driving along at a certain speed, let's say 50 miles per hour, and you spot a cat in the distance. Now, your eyes have just seen the cat, so it takes a while for the message in form of electrical impulses to travel from your brain to your foot before you can react. So for a while, you travel some distance while thinking about what you've just seen. After a while, your brain processes the information and now your foot slams down on the brake. But you don't brake instantly, you brake over a period of time, so you still travel while you're braking. So the distance you travel whilst thinking about braking is called the thinking distance. And once you've applied your brakes, the distance you travel is referred to as the braking distance. By adding the two distances together, you get the stopping distance. So the thinking distance is the distance travelled while you react to a stimulus, and the braking distance is the distance travelled once the brakes have been applied. Adding together makes the stopping distance, the total distance travelled. Now this is very important in terms of road safety because the faster you are travelling, the longer these distances get. For example, at 30 miles per hour, your thinking distance on average is 9 metres, whereas your braking distance is 14 metres, giving you an overall stopping distance of 23 metres. But at 50 miles per hour, 15 metres thinking, 38 metres for braking distance, so the overall stopping distance is 53 metres. Whereas 70 miles per hour, which is a little over half of 30, 21 metres thinking distance, so you can see thinking distance isn't affected as much by speed, but braking distance is hugely affected. By doubling our speed, roughly speaking, we've pretty much multiplied our braking distance by a factor of 6, giving us an overall stopping distance of 96 metres at 70 miles per hour. This is why many road safety adverts have a slogan, kill your speed, not a child. You can see how much safer it is to travel at 30 miles per hour. But speed isn't the only factor that affects these distances. There are other things as well. For example, I'm sure you're aware you should never drink while you are under the influence of alcohol. And that's because alcohol slows down your reflexes, your reaction time. So that greatly increases your thinking distance. If you're tired, also your reactions are going to be slower. So that increases your thinking distance. How old you are affects it. The older you are, the slower messages basically move around your body. And therefore that also increases your thinking distance. Some drugs can decrease your thinking distance. For example, caffeine in coffee is a stimulant, so that will shorten the distance whilst reacting to a stimulus. But certain factors also affect your braking distance. For example, if it's wet or rainy and your road is slippery, that will cause you to basically break over a greater distance. Icy roads will cause you to skid and also it'll take longer to break. However, if there's more friction on the road in the form of, let's say, gravel or grit, that will lower the braking distance. The mass of your car also affects how long it takes for you to stop once you've applied your brakes. The heavier your car, the more momentum it has, as you'll find out in a bit, and that will also increase your braking distance. This is why most drivers stay well away from heavy goods vehicles. Also, the state of your brakes, if your brakes are very old and worn out, that will also reduce the friction effect of the brakes and therefore your braking distance will increase. Something else you need to be aware of, and also this comes up in driving theory tests as well, is you need to be aware of tyre tread, the grooves in the tyre. They should be, in order for you to pass your MOT, 1.6 millimetres deep. You can test this by putting a 20p coin into the groove and you should no longer see the rim of the 20p coin. If you can, it means your tyres are probably worn out. 
and you would be in danger of failing your MOT. The reason why tire tread is important is it reduces the chances of you aquaplaning. Aquaplaning happens when it's been raining and the water basically fills in the grooves and causes a very slippery solid surface. In other words, your tires no longer have any grip so you'll just skid on a film of water. Aquaplaning is incredibly dangerous and can cause many crashes. You can investigate friction very easily. In other words, you can investigate how different surfaces will affect your ability to stop or move. All you do is put an object like a brick on some sandpaper to start off with and attach masses to a pulley system. You keep on adding masses until the brick moves. Then you record the mass it took for the brick to move or the force it took. And now you repeat by changing the surface. Maybe now you try a watery surface or an oily surface. And that is how you describe how different factors affect stopping distance. So now we're going to introduce a new concept. That is the concept of momentum. Momentum is another vector quantity. It has magnitude, a size, and direction. It acts in a direction, positive being the initial direction and negative being the opposite direction. Momentum can be calculated simply by multiplying mass by velocity. It's very hard to explain what momentum is in words. It's much easier to understand it as a mathematical equation. For example, a giant tortoise has a lot of mass but moves very slowly, so the momentum is not going to be very high. Whereas if you take a fly, which moves very quickly, it has a high velocity but it has a very low mass, so once again its momentum is not going to be very high. If you could combine both factors of these creatures, so a very high mass with a very high velocity, well then you're going to have a very high momentum. For example, an asteroid collision, that's an excellent example of something with incredibly high momentum. And objects which have very high momentum can cause a lot of damage. So let's calculate the momentum of two objects. Firstly, we'll take the Hulk, who has a very high mass. But let's assume in this example they're moving at a fairly slow speed, 5 meters per second. To work out the momentum of the Hulk, you'd multiply 2,000 kilograms by 5 meters per second, giving you 10,000 kilogram meters per second. Because you're multiplying kilograms by meters per second, the unit of momentum is kilogram meters per second, with a little space between the kilogram and meters per second. Now let's take a pixie. Now our pixie has a much lower mass, 3 kilograms, and they're moving in the opposite direction, so they have a velocity of minus 600 meters per second. We'll assume it's a very, very fast pixie. So you multiply the two together, and you have minus 1800 kilogram meters per second. Remember minus because it's moving in the opposite direction. So calculating momentum is really easy, just multiplying mass and velocity, but you can take this to another level. So let's assume for a second our Hulk and our Pixie are at war with each other and they decide to run into each other to basically knock each other over. What would be the outcome of this collision? Well, the Pixie would be moving faster than Hulk, so I like this, but they collide. But because the Hulk has more momentum, they both move over, now at a lower velocity in the direction of the Hulk. To work out the new momentum, you simply add the momentum of the Hulk with the momentum of the Pixie together. So 10,000 kilogram meters per second plus negative 1,800 kilograms meters per second. So essentially, when you plus a negative figure, it's just the same as minusing that figure. So you get 8,200 kilogram meters per second. But notice how there's no negative here. That implies that it's moving in the direction of the Hulk. If it was a negative figure, it'd be moving the other direction. The key point here is momentum is conserved. Just like energy, just like matter, Momentum cannot be destroyed or gained, it's always conserved. So the momentum present in both objects before the collision is equal to the momentum when they combine in their collision. Remember, just because it looked like they were moving slower doesn't mean they had less momentum. Sure, they had less velocity, but momentum is mass times velocity, and they have a greater mass now because they're stuck together as one object. But we can get more sophisticated than that as well. I said they'd have a new lower velocity, but how would you work out that velocity? Well, you can rearrange mass times velocity equals momentum to velocity equals momentum divided by mass. So in exams, sometimes they ask you to work out the velocity after a collision. What you would do is divide the combined momentum, that's what we worked out before, 8,200 kilogram meters per second, by the combined mass. 
So before they collide, the Hulk has 2,000 kilogram mass and the Pixie 3 kilogram mass. And when they collide, they now have 2,003 kilograms of mass. So the combined momentum is 8,200 kilogram meters per second. The combined mass is 2,003 kilograms and therefore the new velocity is 4.09 meters per second to the right. Remember to specify the direction. You wouldn't have to say to the right, you could just leave it as a positive value. But if it was in the other direction, you'd have to write minus there. Remember, all of this can be worked out by rearranging this equation here. Momentum equals mass times velocity, but velocity equals momentum divided by mass. And that is how you explain how to calculate momentum. Finally, let's look at how car safety devices work. There are three car safety devices you need to know about. One, airbags. Two, seat belts. Three, crumple zones, which I refer to when I started off this tutorial. Crumple zones basically allow a car to compress on impact. Now, if you had to explain how these devices work, this is what you would say. These devices spread the change in momentum over a greater length of time to lower the resultant force on the driver. Let's explain that in more detail. Imagine I asked you to jump from a fairly high brick wall onto the ground, but I said as an added challenge, do not bend your knees. You can imagine how painful that would be. You feel a real sharp shock wave travel up your body and the chances are you could break your bones. However, now let's say I allowed you to bend your knees. By bending your knees, you basically gradually slow yourself down. So initially, let's say your momentum was 100 kilogram meters per second. And as you fell off, before you bent your knees, if you landed with straight legs, the change in momentum would happen very quickly. But now because you can bend your knees, you spread that change in momentum over a greater time. So you don't get a change from 100 to zero kilogram meters per second in say just one second. But by bending your knees, let's say it takes about two seconds to reduce that 100 kilogram meters per second to zero kilogram meters per second. Do remember, if your velocity is zero, then your momentum will also be zero, because whatever your mass is, if you multiply it by the velocity being zero, multiplying by zero will give you an answer of zero. So basically, seat belts, airbags, and crumple zones act like your knees bending. Parkour runners are experts at increasing the time over which momentum changes occur. You'll see that they bend their knees a lot, they transfer their momentum, and they stop themselves getting injured. This also explains why we basically use bubble wrap to package uh, breakable items. These do exactly the same thing as your knees bending, as seat belts, as crumple zones, but really most aptly like little airbags. Because when a force is applied to the object, it pushes against these air bubbles and they basically compress slowly, again spreading the momentum change over a greater amount of time. So we can express this mathematically by saying change in momentum in kilogram meters per second divided by time equals the resultant force, in other words, the force of impact on the driver. So let's say our driver here is driving an old-fashioned car before a crumple zone, and they don't see the wall, and they crash into the wall. Now, initially, they had a momentum of 1,000 kilogram meters per second, but obviously after the crash, they have no velocity, so they have no momentum. So there's been a change from 1,000 to zero. So the overall change momentum is 1,000 kilogram meters per second. And let's say that change of momentum without a crumple zone took two seconds. So it took two seconds for the car to stop from its momentum of 1,000 kilogram meters per second. Therefore, you could calculate the force, the resultant force on the driver, by dividing the change of momentum, 1,000 kilogram meters per second, by the time the change took, which is two seconds, giving a resultant force of 500 newtons on the driver. However, let's say now they've got a crumple zone, so the crash takes longer. So now the crash is spread over four seconds of time thanks to our crumple zone. So now 1,000 kilograms divided by four is only 250 newtons. So you can see that it's half the force on the driver. So this is what all car safety devices do. They increase the time over which the momentum change occurs, lowering the resultant force. So back to our definition, these devices spread the change in momentum over a greater length of time to lower the resultant force on the driver. You may be expected to recall this definition in an exam, as well as prove it mathematically. And that's how you explain how car safety devices work.